I guess like everybody else, I too would like to thank Jerry Pollack for inviting me. <laughs> and uh, I, put, I put Ed Al first because it was really the Ed Al who did all the experiments I'm going to talk about. And among the Ed Al are actually quite a few people. And um, the people who are here at this meeting, uh, Hiak Yu, Reiner Stahlberg, Ching Zhao, and Adam Wexler, perhaps you've met or, or will meet. Okay. Now, all of this started with a book that I wrote in 2001. And the, uh, it was a somewhat heretical book suggesting as Gilbert Ling would have said had he been able to stay at the meeting, that uh, water structuring inside, inside the cell was extremely important. And that, that's how it, it all started. And one of the diagrams taken from the book, it's meant to be a kind of cartoon as to how water structuring might occur is shown here. And um, so here's a surface with a charge, and you might expect some association of a water dipole, shown here as a little bean with, with the surface. And if you have one dipole adsorbing, you might expect other dipoles to fall in line. And eventually, with lots of surface charges, you'd expect a, a, perhaps a, an array of water dipoles that extend out. And the question is, how far? And that was a question that was not specifically addressed in, in the book. And so that was the experimental question. And the approach initially was to test for the near surface exclusion of solutes. I have no color at all, which is going to be a bit of a problem. Um, problem with what? Maybe depending on the beamer? Maybe, the beamer. If you wouldn't mind, because uh, the colors are going to be important, I think. And um, OK. OK, anyway, let me, let me continue while Tom is working, because my ruthless timekeeper is going to cut me off. Uh, and so, so the idea was to test for near surface exclusion of solutes, because if you have a region next to a surface where the ordering is liquid crystalline, you'd expect that the solutes or particles or whatever would be excluded. And so these experiments were carried out. Uh, uh, Jim, yeah, you can, you can get Jim in, in shape and get his colors. Many of them were carried out by Jim Zhang, who was a postdoc in my lab for actually for six years and carried out at the University of Washington. And Jim. Jim has an engaging personality so that you can see the kinds of, the kinds of people. <laughs> OK. I, I, until now, I didn't realize I was African American. <laughs> anyway, we, we do have some, some issues here. But, but so are all the women. <laughs> um, OK, so this is a the critical observation. This is a, an observation that we made many years ago. And actually, it's a very, a very old slide. It's really simple. We took a gel. This was a polyvinyl alcohol gel. And the gel was sitting in, uh, just sitting in a chamber. And to this chamber, we added water, a suspension of microspheres, these are polystyrene microspheres that we added to the water. And, and we used the microscope to see what would happen as a function of time. And uh, what we found is that the microspheres began moving away from the surface. And they kept moving and moving and moving. And they would actually move to about, about here. It stopped prematurely before they would stop. And this distance is about, uh, in this particular case, 60 or 70 micrometers, 80 micrometers. And these uh, microspheres would undergo very active Brownian motion, but never would they return to, to this region. So at least from a preliminary point of view, it looked as though it might be possible that the kind of structuring or liquid crystalline arrangement could, could extend out quite far. Um, if you look at a specimen after five or 10 minutes after all of that, that movement had occurred. This is an example of a different gel. This is a charged gel, a polyacrylic acid. And here's one edge of the gel. Here's the other edge of the gel. It's a cylindrical gel. This is just an optical uh, reflection, so please ignore it. It's got water on both sides. And initially, there were microspheres and water on both sides. But you can see that all the microspheres had moved away. They would do this on, on this side as well. And it's a quarter of a millimeter. So obviously, the first reaction is there must be some artifact, because this is so simple and so obvious that how could it be that, that this can be cor correct? And so the initial experiments, we spent about a year addressing 
potential artifacts, any ones that, that were suggested to us or that we ourselves could think of. And I want to go into this in great detail, but for example, the, shrill, the gel might shrink continuously, sending water out and pushing the microspheres away. And we made many measurements of, uh, of gels, gel volume as a function of time, and rarely did we see anything more than 1 or 2% over 24 hours. So it wasn't that. Uh, we tested uh, some possibility that the microspheres themselves would have some kind of attractive interaction and pull themselves away from the surface. And uh, we checked that by reducing the concentration by two orders of magnitude and finding essentially no difference. Another possibility that polymer or something else might be diffusing from the gel and creating somehow this kind of zone. And we test that uh, by imposing uh, high flow rates parallel to the surface of the gel. So even with high rates of shear, still we could find this uh, kind of exclusion zone. And another possibility is that polymers are somehow protruding as a, as a brush from the surface, perhaps invisible on the microscope, but they're there. And to test that, we used self-assembled monolayers with carboxyl groups and found the same thing. So it is, there are no polymers, no brushes in, in such a system. So this is, has been published, and there are several other potential artifacts that are also treated. Since then, the phenomenon has been, uh, although not published, uh, confirmed by email saying, we tried it, we found it, by a number of different groups around, around the world. And you can try it yourself. It's really easy. Um, now, so the first question is, how general is this phenomenon? Is it just those couple of gel surfaces that give rise to it? And is it just those... those um, particular microspheres, or is it more general? So considering first surfaces, we tried many gel surfaces. And among the ones we tried, there, there were actually more. All of the ones that I show you show this kind of exclusion phenomenon to, to varying degrees, varying quantitatively, but they all show it. And various microspheres uh, ranging in size from 50 nanometers up to 10 microns. We also checked biological specimens. And this is a piece of muscle sitting actually in a buffer, 150 millimolar buffer. And you don't, see, you don't see quite the exclusion that you saw with the gels, because there are some microspheres here. But if you, if you look at the concentration here versus here, you can see that there's a, a vast difference. We tried also vascular endothelium and found a similar result. And uh, one of the students in the lab tried various plant roots and also found the same. Uh, here's a monolayer uh, on gold, self-assembled monolayer. It's what I mentioned earlier. And you can see a region here that has, is practically devoid of microspheres. And yet, out here, there are many microspheres. This is a smaller region than the others. But nevertheless, it, it, it does happen. So you don't need a specimen that has bulk. It's the surface that matters. We also tried various polymers, apart from the gels, the biological specimens, and polymers. And this is a piece of nafion. Some of you may know about nafion. It's a, a DuPont product. And this, this particular one is very thin film, 200 microns thick, surrounded by water and microspheres. And the sheet of nafion is in the plane of, of the screen. And you can see from the video what happens to the microsphere. So, uh, it's just a piece cut out of a, of a sheet it made to look like an arrow. And it keeps going. And commonly, it will go to three, four, five hundred micrometers and be stable after that. So, so in terms of, of surfaces, uh, the, the hydrophilic surfaces that we tried all show it. We tried several hydrophobic surfaces, and none of them showed it. Uh, then we began looking at solutes. And the excluded species uh, in include, at least among the larger ones, polystyrene microspheres of, of all charge, uh, silica microspheres, erythrocytes, uh, that has re red blood cells, bacteria, uh, several viruses as well, dirt from outside the lab. And perhaps this dirt might be different, and ash, and colloidal gold. They all were excluded. Uh, in terms of smaller solutes, we checked albumin uh, as a common protein. And this is a time series. So here's the first panel and increasing with time. 
And the first panel shows a piece of nafion sitting in water, uh, no protein, and it fluoresces. That's why you can see it. And if you add fluorophore labeled uh, albumin here, you can see that a zone uh, forms as a function of time, similar to the zones that formed with, with the microspheres. Now, we tried sodium fluorescein, uh, th I think 376 molecular weight. This is the first panel, second, third, fourth. And again, you can see that uh, after you put the fluorescein in, this uh, zone increases in width with time. Here, we've used uh, pH-sensitive dyes uh, as a, actually as a measure just to see what, what happens. Uh, here is a piece of nafion. And uh, you can see, first of all, this very nicely colored uh, uh, picture. But what I want to refer to first is that right next to the piece of nafion is a zone, a clear zone, where the dye seems to be absent right next to it that corresponds to the exclusion zone. There's plenty of dye here. And one of the interesting features to which I, I'll return is the color difference. This is very highly acidic, pH close to three, and it becomes progressively uh, uh, farther away from, from being acidic with, with distance. So in terms of the generality, uh, we found that uh, this kind of structuring, and again, I don't mean to imply that it's dipoles that are stacked necessarily. Um, there are many types of hydrophilic surface give rise to this kind, what appears to be some kind of, uh, of structuring, and many solids are included, including small ones such as, as proteins. So now, next question is, uh, I've, I've implied that this zone is really different from ordinary bulk water, but obviously I haven't proved it. All I've demonstrated to you is that lots of solutes are excluded from lots of surfaces to extents that are, are, are quite farther than, than expected. But is this zone really different from bulk water? Is it physically different? And um, last year we published a paper showing several methods that suggested that indeed it, it was different. And I just want to run through a few of of those observations that we've made. And the first one is NMR. What we took is a gel. This was the first gel I showed, polyvinyl alcohol with a 50 to 100 micron exclusion zone next to water. And this is an NMR T2 map. And it shows restric restricted, rotationally restricted water uh, at a zone at the interface, a zone that extends roughly, uh, roughly the size of the exclusion zone. Uh, in terms of infrared radiation, well, uh, Zhenya already showed uh, something. Uh, here's a piece of nafion. This is a, a different uh, image, but it's the same sort of thing that the emissivity of the region right next to the nafion, that's this dark region, is less than the emissivity of the bulk water beyond. And again, it, it extends maybe for something like uh, a third to a half a millimeter, suggesting that the molecules were, were, are more constrained and, and radiating less. Um, next one is potential gradients. And uh, this, is, uh, this represents, if you could see the color, you'd see that this was a blue color and this is white. And this is the interface, the, the boundary running along here uh, between the inside of a gel and, and water. So here's distance and here's the potential, actually potential difference. So to measure the potential difference, uh, what we did is we used one microelectrode in, uh, in this region, and we used a second electrode that was far from this region, far removed. And if you just ignore the nafion curve for a moment, just look at PAA. What that means is the polyacrylic acid gel. Here's the boundary of the gel. Here's the inside of the gel. And if you then measure the potential difference between here and a remote point, you can see that it's zero, which is what you expect. Uh, and so the potential difference in ordinary water is, is, is zero. However, as you get closer to, uh, to the surface of the gel, starting a few hundred microns away, you begin to pick up a negative potential, okay, which is actually seen inside the gel, which is another interesting feature, which I, I don't want to talk about right now. Um, if you do the same with nafion, where the nafion is sitting right here, you can see that that um, the negativity begins, uh, well, actually half a millimeter or more away from the surface of the nafion, and it gets pro uh, progressively more negative and goes down to almost 200 millivolts negative when you're near the surface. And uh, if, uh, if you look the, at, at the exclusion zones, for polyacrylic acid, it's roughly this size, and for nafion, it's roughly this size. So these regions of negativity, these regions where there are potential gradients, correspond to, to this exclusion zone. So apparently, the exclusion zones have negative potential and potential gradients, whereas bulk water doesn't. Now, you might ask, how is it possible? 
this is just water. How is it possible that the water is negative? Uh, and so, uh, of course, one, one possibility extends from uh, the talk that Emilio uh, gave the, the other day, yesterday. Um, and, but actually, we, we measured to see what would happen. And if this region is, is negative, one possibility is that it's somehow gotten rid of some, some of the positive charge contained in the water. And many measurements we showed uh, revealed that the region well beyond this exclusion zone is very, very full of, of hydrogen ions. You saw this red color right next to the exclusion zone. And we've made many measurements of pH by different methods. And they all show a very high proton concentration beyond. So it looks as though the reason this is negative is somehow it gets rid of positive charges and thereby becomes negative. The next one is the light absorption spectrum. That's the UV viz. And the experiment is conceptually very simple. So we take a, a cuvette, a spectrophotometer cuvette, a piece of naphion, and the water is sitting right here. And we have two slits so that the light is directed uh, parallel to the surface of naphion. And we can move the naphion cuvette or the cuvette back and forth. And so we can therefore probe at different distances from the naphion surface. We can pr probe the exclusion zone and probe regions beyond. And so what we found is uh, this is the absorbance. And here's the spectrum. And we start at 2 millimeters from the surface. And you can see nothing interesting. Uh, as you get a little closer, you begin to pick up something. And when you get roughly into where the exclusion zone begins, you see a very big absorption in the UV at 270 nanometers. If you get even closer, this is a less sensitive scale. If you get closer, you can see that it becomes extremely strong. And so it appears from, from these measurements that this exclusion zone has a 270 nanometer absorption that bulk water doesn't have, again, suggesting uh, some difference. Now, if this 270 nanometer absorption is a, um, some sort of reflection of the character of water organization and water structure, then you might expect that other situations where you have water structure might also show it. And uh, we checked various uh, things. We ch checked near saturated salt solutions, uh, various salts, and we could see the same uh, uh, absorption. Uh, we tried various sugar solutions, and we could see the same. And uh, PEG solutions. Uh, other people have found proteins in DNA absorbed. Uh, some amino acids we found absorbed. And we found, uh, interesting, that after the next talk, that natural but not unnatural substances, for example, D-glucose, but not L-glucose, and L-lysine, but not D-lysine, uh, also absorbed at 270 nanometers, suggesting that uh, the chirality may also be associated with some kind of uh, water ordering. So, so it's possible that the 270 nanometer absorption may be a, a kind of signature of structured uh, water. Uh, since I have 10 minutes left, let me um, skip the next one. This is uh, just was intended to show with a falling ball viscometer that you have higher viscosity in this region than bulk water. But I'm going to skip it because of time. And we've done preliminary experiments on polarizing microscopy. The first to see if the molecules of water are indeed somehow lined up like a liquid crystal. The first experiments were done by a colleague, not by us. Uh, this was done by Gerhard Artmann uh, in, in Germany, in Aachen. And uh, here's an agarose gel. And they used cross polarizers. Here's the water. And they found, indeed, a region of birefringence, which they're studying. Now, we started experiments, too. And uh, this is a preliminary observation. We're just checking controls right now. So we're not sure if this is real or not. But again, it's a piece of, of naphion. And you can see that the uh, area of birefringence extends well into the water. And it corresponds roughly to what you might expect from the previous uh, experiments. That one is, is still ongoing and by no means certain. So I've demonstrated to you that uh, several different measures really show that the, the water seems to be different in that zone. NMR, that the water has a reduced rotational mobility. Uh, infrared radiation, uh, less from the exclusion zone than from bulk water. Uh, potential gradient within the exclusion zone, but not outside the exclusion zone. The light absorption spectrum is clearly different. Uh, this, this particular zone absorbs at 270. Ordinary water doesn't. Uh, I haven't shown you the falling ball viscometry, which indicates higher viscosity up to a few hundred microns from the surface, much higher, uh, and polarizing microscopy ongoing. So, so 
these are all long range, and the first two uh, for sure suggest some kind of stability of structure in this zone. So the hypothesis uh, where we are at, at this point is that we have some sort of zone over here which appears to be physically different. It may be liquid crystalline. It excludes many different solutes, although not all uh, solutes, and it may extend very far from the surface. And uh, that's, there was a big box here that was blue and it doesn't show up at all, so I think blue is missing. Uh, and, and so this may apply to all hydrophilic surfaces, including biological. And the point is, it may extend very far is a major point. Question three, which I'll address briefly. Um, the question is, what powers all of this structural buildup? And we've heard about uh, the possibility of quantum electrodynamics. And I, I think this kind of fits in to, to some extent. And what I'm actually going to show you is, is evidence that actually that incident radiant energy may be responsible for building this kind of structure. And so here's an example. This is a piece of nafion. Uh, here are the microspheres, and here's the exclusion zone that you've been seeing. This is all green because we've used green light for illumination. This is a, a control. And for five minutes, we added, in this case, broadband IR. And you can see that the zone is considerably bigger. And if you remove the IR, um, uh, then this disappears with a time constant that's uh, slightly longer than the one that you see here. We've also tried, here is Nafion, and here's the exclusion zone, using a point source here, and you can see that the exclusion zone grows more around the, where the intensity is highest than flanking regions where the intensity is lower. We've used LEDs uh, with specific uh, discrete wavelengths. and. Uh, uh, this is the control again. Here's Nafion. Here's the exclusion zone and the microspheres. And in this case, um, you can see, if, if, pardon the fact that this is slightly lower intensity all over. It's just a technical artifact. It's not related to the result. Um, here um, is a piece of Nafion. And after five minutes of exposure, um, was this five or 10? I'm sorry, I forgot. Um, but anyway, you can see that it's increased by approximately four times. So it's a very powerful effect. And the intensity of exposure, which the, intensi the absolute value would probably mean not too much to you, is such that the temperature rise during this exposure period measured at various points along here is no more than one degree. So this powerful effect occurs with only a very small amount of, of heating. Uh, as a function of time, the exclusion zone size increases uh, almost linearly, um, low power, mid power, high power. And it levels off only, I haven't shown it here, only after 20 or 30 minutes, depending on the particular size. We've also begun a wavelength, the effects of looking at different wavelengths, five minute exposure. Now, here is the infrared, and we've tried several discrete wavelengths. Uh, and the power, incident power, is kept constant uh, for all of these wavelengths with the power meter that we have. And you can see that the effects are not the same for different wavelengths that at uh, two microns, and at, especially at three microns, which is known to be the maximum absorption uh, of, uh, uh, of, of water, the effect is much greater than, than uh, at the other wavelengths. So, so the effect of increasing the exclusion zone corresponds very nicely to the effect of absorption of these wavelengths in water. We've also used visible wavelengths. And as you can see, visible wavelengths also have an effect. These are UV wavelengths here. The fact that they're approximately the same is an artifact because it's very difficult to compare the intensities in the visible region with the intensities in the IR region because we're using two, def two different uh, sensors. And it hasn't been possible yet to compare the two to make sure that the intensities are the same. But anyway, within this range, within the visible range, the relative intensities are constant, and yet the effect seems to be quite wavelength dependent. Probably, if we use the same intensities, this point would correspond with this point. This would be lower, but we're not sure of that yet. At any rate, there is certainly a wavelength sensitivity to, to this effect. So a possible energy flow is something like this. We have radiant en energy, incident radiant energy, particularly 
infrared energy hits the water, and of course it generates some heat, although in our experiments not very much. It also imparts somehow, in a way that's not clear yet, some sort of a chemical energy that is perhaps somehow responsible for building this exclusion zone. Now in ordinary experiments, you can't get rid of the infrared, and so you have it around all the time. So the fact that we see this without extra infrared doesn't necessarily mean that, that uh, that this is not the primary source of energy for, for, for this, this buildup. Uh, last week's observation in the last one minute uh, is uh, from one of the students in, in the lab, uh, Jennifer Wu, together with uh, Reinar Stahlberg. Well, Jennifer did the following experiment. She took an ordinary chamber like this, and she filled it with water and microspheres. And it's connected with a piece, an aluminum strip. And the reason for the aluminum strip is that in the experiments with Reiner, uh, she had been working to cool this. We were interested in ice formation to see what happens as the ice formed around the cooling strip. But she did a control. She didn't put it next to the Peltier device. She just left it on the bench. And leaving it on the bench for 24 hours resulted in a rather large, in fact, extremely large uh, zone where there were no microspheres. And this is not simply due to some sort of gravitational settling because she made sure that the height of this part and this part were such that this was absolutely horizontal. So it appears, and so one possibility that we had been thinking uh, is that perhaps somehow this aluminum strip was either picking up our